Okay. Hello, everyone, and good evening. Welcome to the 10th annual Stand With Us Campus Champions Gala. For everybody's health and safety, please wear your masks at all times. And now, please welcome your Stand With Us Midwest Executive Director, Asaf Grunberg. Wow, what a room, what a room. Hi everyone, good night, good evening. Thank you for coming. Thank you everyone for being here tonight. I appreciate you being here. Consul General Inam Cohen, Roz and Jerry Rothstein, stand with us staff, friends, Thank you for coming here tonight. Thank you and welcome to the 10th annual Campus Champions Gala in person. For those of you thinking to yourself, uh, wow, Peggy had some work done. I am Asaf Gromberg, the Stand With Us Midwest Executive Director. And it is really hard to express in words how much we have all missed you seeing you in person. All of us that stand with us are truly grateful for your support during these challenging times. The pandemic has affected every aspect of our daily lives. But even during the worst of it, one thing did not change. Stand with us produced hundreds of events reaching millions around the world through online programs. We created new content like Stand With Us TV and the Zionist Movie Club and develop real virtual tours in the streets of Jerusalem and the hills of the Golan Heights. We engage with students even as they move back into their parents' basements. <laughs> Our team here in Chicago and on five continents did not rest one second, knowing that there was an ancient virus out there, the virus of anti-Semitism. Anti-Semitism doesn't rest. It mutates, it creates new variants that affect our children in person and online. Stand With Us as Education is there to inoculate our community against that illness. We're opening people's minds to the facts and truth of the beautiful, incredible Israeli society and all that it does for our world. Our program tonight highlights the important work that Stand With Us does to support pro-Israel students bring strong, meaningful, lasting connections to Israel, engage with communities in need, educate lawmakers and decision makers, and fight anti-Semitism in any form and from any direction. Our focus on social media has never been more impactful than it is today, reaching hundreds of millions in over half a dozen languages, including Arabic. Tonight, we'll be honoring Avital and Tomer, two students who have taught us that Israel education belongs everywhere and that we should always stand up for what's right. Tonight's honorees, Terry and Howard Schneider. The <laughs> Absolutely. Terry and Howard decided to spend their retirement working even harder to share Israel with their community and make sure every person they meet is exposed to the actual facts not the ones they see in the news. We're honoring the incredible Peggy Shapiro. We're honoring Peggy for her work for Israel and the Jewish people. As many of you know, this is Peggy's second retirement. And we can only wonder if she'll slow down a little bit and maybe work only 12 hours a day. If there's one thing that Peggy has taught us is that sleep is a suggestion and that 24 seven is merely a number in the pursuit for a world free from hatred and bigotry. I would like to thank the incredible gala committee for their assistance, partnership, ideas, and hard work that made this evening possible. <laughs> gala committee members, please stand as I call your name. Gala Chairs, Pam Brill and Carol Mastow. 
Hannah Anderson. John Barker. Stand up. We want to see you. Carol Burton. Janice Hefter. Helene Herbstman. Abby Lasky. Sherry Ross. Rachel Sapinsley. Howard Schneider. And Barbara Silverman. Stay standing for one second. I'm very lucky to begin my tenure as the Midwest Executive Director, knowing that I have the support of the best board in the world. They're always there with me, sharing their wisdom and saying yes to any task that helps support our mission. Stand with us, Midwest Board. Please stand. I am confident that with you by my side, the Midwest region will continue to lead in creativity and innovation. And last but absolutely not least, the Stand With Us staff, whose tireless work has made tremendous impact on our students and our community members across the Midwest and around the country. Stand With Us staff, please stand. They're here. Thank you. I am honored to have you by my side. Well, thank you everyone for joining this evening in person for a wonderful evening to support the work that Stand With Us does. I'd like to welcome to the stage our phenomenal MC this evening, Olga Mashwe Washington. Thank you. Well, hello everyone and good evening. My name is Olga Mishra Washington and I have the pleasure of being your MC for this evening. Welcome to the 2021 Stand With Us Campus Champions Gala. We are so honored to have you here with us as we celebrate the incredible work that Stand With Us has done and continues to do. And also as we learn together about some of the amazing people standing up to anti-Semitism across the world. Thank you so much to our campus champions. Your work is vital to the work that, and the existence of Stand With Us. Even through the pandemic, our workload has unfortunately intensified. Because you see, anti-Semitism and the fight online, particularly on social media, is more aggressive than ever. I have been the target of hate after I made the decision to stand up for Israel. In brief, there was a season of my life where standing up for Israel, standing up for the Jewish people, eh, not my problem. I was busy. I was busy doing my own thing, successful career. It wasn't my problem. But then I learned of the fact that there was hatred targeted against the people purely because of who they were. I also learned that there was a state that had been a friend to the continent from which I hail, that there was this ancient relationship between Africa and Israel. And as I learned, I then realized that I needed to do something with my big mouth and start to speak up and say, not on my watch will anti-Semitism thrive. And so I started to speak. And as I spoke, I lost friends and I earned new titles. Slave to the Jewish master, sellout are my two favorite ones. Whereas on the surface, they seem to be painful titles, to me, they've become irrelevant because I understand what's at stake. I understand the importance of standing up to hate. I also understand the importance of saying no to anti-Semitism. And so standing before you here tonight as your MC is a proud, unapologetic Zionist who will continue to speak up and continue to join hands with the incredible organization like Stand With Us as we bring an end to what we see online and also in person in regards to against the Jewish people. Tonight, we will honor or rather, we will hear from some amazing people that are doing just that, standing up to anti-Semitism. We will honor Tome and Jaco, as well as Avital Strauss, incredible students who have taken a stand for Israel 
and taken a stand against hate. We will also honor Howard and Terry Schneider, who have made it their mission to teach about Israel. And we will honor the incredible Peggy Shapiro for her invaluable work as the Stand With Us Midwest Executive Director for 11 incredible years. Yes, let's give her a hand. Later this evening, I will have the pleasure of sitting down and speaking with Marty Friedman. He is an Israeli-Canadian journalist and author, and we're going to talk about the media's malfunction as well as mythology about Israel. So, please join me and sit back and enjoy this evening. Now, let's please hear from the incredible Tiana Strong as she leads us in the national anthems. much, Tiana. And now, for greetings from Israel, please join me in welcoming the Consul General of Israel to the Midwest, Yinam Cohen. <laughs> Good evening, everybody. So amazing to be with so many friends of Israel. And so good to be, to, uh, to be able to see everyone in person again. Thank you for that. Just as you stand with the state of Israel, we stand with you. And we cannot thank you enough for that. We recognize and deeply appreciate that you stand with us in times of peace. That you stand with us in times of crisis that you stand with us when rockets rain down on us, that you stand with us to share Israel's successes, and that you stand with us to share Israel's challenges. We know and value that you stand with us on colleges' campuses, that you stand with us on so many advocacy meetings, that you stand with us in your Zionist movie club, that you stand with us with your speakers, that you stand with us during COVID, that you stand with us always, that you stand with us in the amazing bond between the United States and Israel, between the Midwest and Israel, between Chicago and Israel. I want to acknowledge Peggy Shapiro, and her spectacular staff. Your retiring Midwest Executive Director is an outstanding, powerful, and vocal supporter and friend of Israel. We will truly miss her. I know that Asaf Grunberg is an expert successor and that we will continue to work together in the future. I can't pass the opportunity to encourage, to encourage you all to come to Israel now that we have opened up for visits again. <laughs> Israel missed you, and we look forward to seeing you in our homeland again. Just make sure to get vexed. <laughs> On behalf of the State of Israel, to you, our deepest and most sincere appreciation for all that you do. We know that we can always count on stand with us. Thank you so much. And now, please welcome Stand With Us Midwest Board Chair, Dr. Sherry Ross. Well, 
thank you very much, Council General Cohn. What a meaningful message to, as Stand With Us continues to be your partner with your offices around the world. Hello, everyone. My name is Sherry Ross. I'm the Stand With Us Midwest Board Chair. Tonight, we are honoring Howard and Terry Schneider, who have done so much for Stand With Us. Here's a short video about their inspiring leadership. Take a look. I grew up in West Rogers Park, which was a very Jewish neighborhood. Never questioned of, of where we came from. My mother kept kosher, but we weren't what I would call a very observant family. I was born in Chicago, and my parents moved to Morton Grove when I was seven. I grew up in what I would like to call a very traditional family. My father, who was in the army, fought in Europe in France, Belgium, Luxembourg. When he came home, there was never any conversation of where he was at. And as I got older, I started to think, how did that conversation never come up? How did it, the whole idea of the Nazis, it's not like he was isolated, he was right there. When I started getting older, that I was more inquisitive and just didn't understand what did American Jews do in the 1940s, the 1930s? Did they not know what was happening? And I think that's what led to some of my interests. Howard and I had never been to Israel. And when we went there, it was a life-changing experience. I remember walking uh, through the Palmach Museum I burst out crying. I didn't even know what I was crying about. And when I came home and went to work, um, the executive director asked me this question. What kind of homes do Israelis live in? And I said to her, Israelis live in the same kind of homes that we do. But when she thought of Israel, she thought of the desert and that people maybe were still living in tents. Three, four years ago, I retired, um, and I was looking for something to get involved with, but it had to be something I was passionate about. Uh, and I went up to Peggy, and I said, Peggy, I need something. And she said, can you come to the board meeting? And when I walked in, I felt that I was a part of it right from the beginning. I think that Stand With Us is an important organization from the standpoint that it educates people. It's getting into the college campuses and it's educating them on what to do to be able to stand up to being bullied. In the 40s, the 50s, no, nobody talked about anything. And too many of us grew up saying, how come nobody talked about it? How come nobody did anything? How come we don't know anything? And it was one of my missions is to get people involved so that when the next generation comes along, they don't say, Dad, Mom, how come you didn't do anything? All this anti-Semitism was growing. What did you do to fight it? I just didn't want to come up with a, I don't know. My kids know what I do. So everybody, please help me welcome tonight's Stand With Us Campus Champions honorees, Howard and Terry Schneider. commitment to education, Israel, and the Jewish people, November 7th, 2021. Thank you. Well, 
Well, first of all, thank you all. It's been truly a great honor to be recognized by Stand With Us and to be supported by so many friends and family. This has been a tough year and a half due to the pandemic, and we appreciate your support. With the uh, steady rise of anti-Semitism, the work that Stand With Us does is more important than ever. So thank you so much for being here and for supporting Stand With Us. Thank you. So our next speaker is an extraordinary woman, a daughter of Holocaust survivors. She was a family therapist for over two decades in the state of California and sat on a variety of Jewish organizational boards as a lay leader before helping co-found Stand With Us with her husband Jerry and community activist Esther Renzer. Stand With Us now has offices on five continents around the world, educating people and fighting all forms of anti-Semitism. She hosts a weekly TV show on JLTV every Tuesday night about Israel-related issues and is a regular host on Stand With Us TV. The Forward Magazine has twice named her one of the 50 most influential Jews in America, and Jerusalem Post has twice named her one of the 50 most influential Jews in the world. Please welcome Stand With Us co-founder and international CEO, Roz Rothstein. Thank you for that good music. Hi, everybody. Hi. So great to see you in person. Yes. So good evening. I'm delighted to be with you here tonight for so many reasons, not the least of which is that we're all in person which is amazing, and not many organizations are doing this, but uh, you know, we, we went out on a limb, and I'm glad we did. So I wanna give a big, sh I wanna thank you all for being here tonight, and also I wanna give a big shout out to our non-Jewish friends who are here tonight and who help us on a regular basis. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I would like to ask Jerry Rothstein, co-founder and COO of this incredible growing organization to please stand. You work so hard every day for Israel and the Jewish people. And by the way, happy birthday. <laughs> We're both so excited to be with you tonight. Thank you to our incredible team that works here locally, and also those that flew in to make sure that this evening was a success, like Gary Ratner, our senior executive, who is our right-hand man for me and Jerry, and Aaron Alcabez, and Roy Stein, and Emmett O'Connellan, and Leora Bacharach, and Asaf Grunberg, all of you, thank you all for lifting up this organization and making it what it is. I wanna give a big virtual hug also to our incredible local board. You guys are so extraordinary. You're a model board because of how extremely passionate you are and how loving you are and how you put your hands on everything. Thank you, thank you, thank you. So tonight, we're pleased to be honoring our two amazing student leaders, Avital and Tomer, Mazal Tov, and we are excited to honor such a wonderful, well-deserving couple, Howard and Terry Schneider, and of course, our own incredible Zionist superstar leader, Peggy Shapiro. <laughs> Sitting in the audience tonight, we have the pleasure of having with us another hero of the Jewish people. Her name is Owen. She worked for 30 years to liberate the Jews the Jewish people of Russia. She was selfless, she was determined, and she was successful. She never lost focus, but you know what motivated her initially? She learned as a teenager that the American Jews didn't fight hard enough to free the Jews of Europe during the Holocaust. And she was devastated by that realization, including the realization that one million Jewish children were murdered. 
So when she heard about the suffering of the Soviet Jews, she said these words, not on my watch. And she said, Hineni, here I am. And she continued to say it for 30 years until the Jews of Russia were free. Pamela, please stand up and be recognized. Where are you? There she is. There she is. Yes. Thank you, Pamela. So isn't that really the reason that we're all here tonight? For each of our honorees, isn't that precisely why we are honoring them? Because they all continue to say, Hineni, here I am. I will help. All extraordinary people like the fine cream that rises to the top when the going gets rough. And the going has certainly been rough with rising anti-Semitism on college campuses and beyond. These are the very people of all ages that stand with us as collected over the 20 years of our development in cities around the world on five continents. Current threats to Israel and the Jewish people beckon them to the task, and they answer, they gather, they say, Hineni, here I am, and here we are tonight, all together. Stand With Us supports Israel and fights anti-Semitism, and we have never deviated from our mission for 20 years. So when we hear about a teacher's assistant at Johns Hopkins write a social media post to her followers saying, how many of you think I should fail my Zionist students? At Stand With Us, we get involved. We say, Hineni. When we hear that a Jewish college student was kept outside of a public meeting because the organizers of that meeting didn't want to allow a Zionist in, and we have, have it all on record, Stand With Us gets involved and we say, Hineni. And by the way, that story is actually going to break this coming week and you're all gonna hear about it. When a very high percentage of our Kenneth Leventhal high school students, our high school students are telling us that nearly 100% of them have personally experienced anti-Semitism, that more teens have personally experienced bigotry against Jews than ever before, that too many of them have seen swastikas at their school, swastikas. At Stand With Us, we say Hineni, and we are very involved. When there is a new requirement that high school students take ethnic studies classes before they graduate, but we know that there are groups of people trying to turn that very curriculum into something that is supposed to taint Israel, distort it, and marginalize all of its supporters, Stand With Us must remain heavily involved. When Ben and Jerry's announced that they will boycott the West Bank, including East Jerusalem, and their parent company, Unilever, claims that they just cannot reverse the boycott, and we know that is untrue. We get involved, and we will remain involved until Unilever reverses its boycott. <laughs> they think that we will go away and we will forget, but we will not forget, never again. And I know too well what silence can bring. Silence has never served the Jewish people well. I lost 80 members of my family in the Holocaust, men, women, babies, and we must, we must not be silent. And it's not just about the fight. It's also not just about responding to the anti-Semitism, no. We also get involved in proactive education because if we don't inspire and educate our children and grandchildren, there will be nobody in 20 years to pick up the gauntlet and say these precious words, not on my watch, 
Hineni. So here's the good news. Our programs are growing. The numbers of students reached every single year continues to grow. We're literally reaching hundreds of thousands of students every single year. And our social media work reaches millions of people every single week. We are leaders in social media, including in Arabic. Our legal department has grown. We now have 250 pro bono attorneys across the country, and we have dealt with more than 1,700 different incidents. We have had to grow because in 2021 alone, there has been a 40% increase in the numbers of requests that we get in the legal department at Stand With Us. So we must continue to say Hineni together because if we don't, who will? Stand With Us was created 20 years ago because there was a need for all the different ways that we support Israel and fight anti-Semitism. We will continue to remain strong. We will continue to represent your priorities. And I want to thank you, all of you, for supporting us and standing with us. I want to thank the incoming Stand With Us Midwest, Midwest Executive Director, Asaf Grumberg. whose leadership and expertise will continue to lift up the Midwest in all the ways that we need it to be lifted up. And now let's take a moment and turn our attention to someone who is no stranger to fighting anti-Semitism and standing up for what is right. Let's talk for a moment about Peggy Shapiro, who gets more things accomplished in one day than is humanly possible because Peggy has always understood that it is a race against time, and that there is a grave danger in ignoring rising anti-Semitism. She also understands that we cannot abandon the task at hand and assume that someone else will take care of it, because they won't, necessarily. Peggy, ever since that first time that we met in Washington, D.C., you have grown this office in so many different ways, so impressively. It's, it's just incredible and it's hard to believe. You have concentrated not only on fighting the fight and fighting against hate, but on building the important bridges with the Hindu community and also with many Christian communities. Your innovative work in partnership with other organizations to get over 30 states to adopt anti-BDS legislation is actually helping us right now in the fight against Ben and Jerry's. Your work on the adoption of IRA, the working definition of anti-Semitism, will help put a meaningful definition in place so that we have a solid understanding of what anti-Semitism is when we see it and when we need to define it on campuses and beyond. We have been so fortunate to have you as a key leader on our team, and we are delighted that you will remain a member of our professional team on a part-time basis, so we're not really saying goodbye to you at all, because there is so much for us to do in the coming years, Peggy, so I know you're gonna be right there with us. Let's look at this beautiful tribute that we put together in honor of you, Peggy Shapiro. Peggy Shapiro is indefatigable. She's unstoppable. And her work reverberates all around the world for everyone to see. When I grow up, I'd like to be just like Peggy Shapiro. But I know I speak on behalf of all of our colleagues here in Israel when I say thank you, Peggy, for all that you've achieved, for all that you do. We respect and admire you so much. And I know that people here in Israel can sleep more soundly knowing that Peggy has our back and Peggy's speaking out on our behalf. God bless you, Peggy Shapiro. Thank you for everything that you've achieved for the state of Israel and for the Jewish people.
The first time I met Peggy, I was at an APAC conference in Washington, D.C. with my husband, Ed. Ed and I headed over to the building to sit down with the congressman, and the only other people in the room were Peggy and Ron. So that was the first time I ever met Peggy. And all I can remember is, who is this beautiful, smart lady? I don't remember exactly when I met Peggy, but I feel like I've always known her. I've been on the Stand With Us board since Peggy opened the Chicago office more than 10 years ago. Peggy continually has these creative ideas that has such an impact on the evolution of Stand With Us, and I just wanted to be part of those activities. And I was just struck by how uh, professional she was and, and what a great organizer she was and how she could motivate people. And she just thought very strategically and seemed to be very uh, efficient at getting events off the ground, like knowing how to reach the right people and how to promote. What I love is how Peggy just has this whole soup to nuts agenda. She, she just doesn't leave out a single detail and it, it's really fun to be involved in a process with Peggy. She gives you directions, she gives you marching orders and you just go with it and you know that the end product is just going to be this amazing event. Peggy found out that there was a a community on the south side of Chicago, a distressed community that was in desperate need of baby formula. And Peggy being Peggy, she didn't wait for anybody. She rented a U-Haul and we drove down to Woodlawns to deliver these baby products. She's tireless in her efforts and she goes and drives eight hours to Michigan to be at a church or she'll drive six hours to Arkansas to be with meeting with a pastor. There's no one in this community of all the people I know from all the different organizations that does more than Peggy Shapiro for helping the Jewish community in Israel. You know, she doesn't miss an opportunity to create a better relationship. She inspires me, she's my mentor, and best of all, I'm so proud and blessed that I can call her my friend. I was born in a displaced persons camp in Landsberg, Germany. That's where Hitler wrote Mein Kampf. I was a child of Holocaust survivors, and my birth was on the ashes of a thousand-year-old Jewish community. Our family had four children, because Israel was like the fourth child, cherished and as important as any of us. When I think of the courage that it took for survivors who were starved and sick and demoralized to create the hope of establishing a country to choose life, it was that same hope that I was born out of, to choose life. My parents were very involved in the Jewish community. It was a very Jewish upbringing. After I retired from the city colleges, I felt I still had something left to give. So I met with Larry Hochberg right after that call. I met Roz and Jerry, and I started with Stand With Us. Stand With Us has given me what I call the, the wind beneath my wings. I've been able to meet with legislators across the country and educate them about the dangers of BDS, not just to Israel, but to our United States and the individual states. And through Stand With Us, I was able to reach out to various communities, Yazidi, Christian, Hindu, black, brown, and see that we have allies. We just need to ask. Stand With Us is important because the war against Israel and the Jewish people is taking place on many fronts. It's in academia, on campus, in high school, in the media, in social media, in cultural activities. And the response has to be on many fronts. If there had been a stand with us, history may have played out differently. But because there is a stand with us, the Jewish future and our destiny 
is more secure. Would everyone please welcome to the stage Peggy Shapiro. And, uh, and this says, Peggy Shapiro, for your leadership and lifetime of passion, commitment, and advocacy for Israel and the Jewish people, November 7th, 2021. And uh, for me, I had to do something extra uh, for Peggy. Uh, Peggy always reminds me of the saying, Im eshkachech Yerushalayim tishkach yamini. Uh, and that is, if, if I forget you, O Jerusalem, let my right hand stop working. Um, every single day of her life, she's thinking about Israel and the Jewish people. So I wanted to get you Jerusalem stone just to remind you of who you are and how much we love you. And so they opened up the Holocaust Museum, especially for me, to buy this for you, Peggy. And I have brought it for you myself. I, I schlepped this. It's not, it's, I'm holding it up, but it's heavy. So, <laughs> but it's not heavy. It's our, actually our, our heavy. mission. It's heavy, right? Yeah. <laughs> I'm putting it here. Do not leave it here tonight. Mazal tov, Peggy. Okay, one second. Picture time. Thank you. My gratitude is for more than the generous words and these beautiful, meaningful awards. And my gratitude is from more than just myself. My mother, Miriam Rosenbaum, a blessed memory, loved Stand With Us. She went to every Stand With Us gala. In fact, her last event in public was a Stand With Us Christian Jewish celebration of Israel. She was very sick, but she summoned her strength, got out of her hospice bed, put on makeup and her pearls, and entered with all her elegance to say thank you to Stand With Us supporters, Jewish and non-Jewish. As you know, my mother and father were Holocaust survivors. My mother was 12 years old when the Nazis entered her town of Sosnovich, Poland. They confiscated her father's small fabric shop and the other store owners were silent. Then they forced her family to move from their home to Chasna, a ghetto whose claustrophobic dark walls will not allow a blade of grass to grow even today. And the neighbors hid behind closed doors in silence. Their little synagogue was desecrated, but the churches said nothing. She and her siblings and all Jewish children were prohibited from going to school. But the teachers carried on without a word of support. At 14, my mother was sent to the Langenbilau concentration camp. And she told me, that while standing for an hour or more 
on the frozen terrain in the morning roll call without a coat or boots, or witnessing young women being tortured and humiliated for guards' entertainment, or experiencing hunger and loneliness which were too much for her to bear, she thought, if Jews in America find out that the Jews in Europe are burning, they will turn the earth upside down. They won't stop until they save us. In death camps, in ghettos, in cattle cars, slave labor camps, or hiding in the forests, my family experienced brutality, deprivation, starvation, and fear that we cannot fathom, but they clung on to life and to hope that their cries will be heard by Jews and other people of good faith. When she came to the United States, she discovered, and was heartbroken, that people had known, but said little and done less. She heard of the here heroic work of Peter Bergson and his group who frantically tried to rescue Europe's Jews, but their outcries fell on ears that chose not to hear. So tonight, on my mother's behalf and mine, I thank Stand With Us, which is the answer to silence. When anti-Semitic billboards go up in communities, as is happening in South Africa right now, we mobilize to respond forcefully or take them down. When students are threatened for embracing their Jewish identity and connection to Israel, the Stand With Us Center for Combating Anti-Semitism and our legal team send out thousands of letters to administrators and take legal action when possible. When states are pressured to divest from Israel, Stand With Us is among the leaders to support anti-BDS legislation, and now 33 states have passed it. When Israel is under attack by rockets and the media, the Stand With Us social media team gets the word out, gets the news out before most reporters get their shoes on. And Stand With Us reaches out to Christian, Muslim, and Hindu friends who speak up in support of Israel. When convicted terrorists, such as Razmiya Odeid, try to camouflage their sordid pasts, to appear to be human rights advocates, as we had right here in the Midwest. Stand With Us is here to expose and expel them. Thank you. Thank you for this honor. But thank you more for the sacred work you do to stand up for Israel and fight against anti-Semitism. Thank you for giving my grandchildren and other Jewish children the support that my mother and father could only have dreamed of. Thank you for creating an army of educators who in 18 languages understand that they, no, that we must say no to silence. Thank you. Peggy leaves behind a legacy of strength and dedication to education and supporting young people and that work would not be possible without passionate and talented professionals on the ground 
working with high schools and college students. Please welcome Stand With Us Associate Director of High School Education and Stand With Us Senior Midwest Campus Coordinator, Adam Blue and Rebecca Fine. The Stand With Us Kenneth Leventhal High School Internship a prestigious one-year experience, receives hundreds of nominees each year from across the U.S. and Canada. Last year, these nearly 700 nominees included student leaders, community activists, club presidents, captains of sports teams, youth group officers, and many other students with impressive credentials, but only 125 of them would become interns. More impressively, only 29 of them were juniors in high school. Avital Strauss was one of these students. You would think that being at a Jewish day school, Avital's audience would be primed to enjoy learning about Israel and combating anti-Semitism. Yet Israel was often compartmentalized to classroom learning about modern or biblical Israel. Avital's challenge was to convince teenagers to care about something that they already knew about. Therefore, Avital set out to bring Israel education to spaces where her peers had not considered it previously. For example, Avital created a program about Golda Meir for the Feminism Club. She brought to young feminists Golda Meir, Prime Minister of Israel, pioneer, visionary, risk taker, eloquent advocate, and poster child for feminism in the 1970s. They became connected to Israel through a woman whose life story is central to the story of Zionism. Through a mental health club, Avital developed a program to discuss the traumatic experience of tens of thousands of Israeli children who have heard the code read hundreds of times and had to run into bomb shelters with their families. These American students connected with their Israeli peers who, had to, who have to deal with bouts of fear and anxiety. Considering that nobody really understands how Israeli elections work, Avital worked with her school's Hebrew class to run a game about effective about effectively engaging students in a mock version of the Knesset's complex coalition building process. Students who had previously been indifferent flocked to her programming. Interns are required to present four programs during the year. Avital developed seven. Please join me in recognizing Avital Strauss for her leadership, her impressive accomplishments, and her dedication to our cause. The Stand With Us Emerson Fellowship is a prestigious one-year internship for college sophomores, juniors, and seniors. Every year, one student from each major campus is chosen uh, to speak up against anti-Semitism and educate their peers about Israel. Tomer and Jekko exemplified the spirit of the Emerson Fellowship. Though Tomer is too modest to brag himself, as his campus coordinator, I have the honor to, to share some of his accomplishments today. In the challenging isolation of the pandemic, uh, Tomer brought rich educational programs such as conversations with Dennis Ross and Avi Dickner to his campus. After Israel responded to over 4,000 Hamas rockets last summer, the University of Michigan student government released a statement condemning Israel. Some Jewish students were indifferent, some uninformed, and many felt powerless against the loud anti-Israel voice on campus. Tomer didn't. He signed up to speak at the next student government meeting, mobilized other students, and helped them write their speeches. At the meeting, he was outnumbered, but certainly undeterred. He spoke forcefully, telling student government, and even more importantly, all those who were listening in that meeting, that the anti-Israel statement ignored violence against Israel's civilians and did not represent the reality on the ground and spread misinformation. Furthermore, he made it clear that the misguided statement maligned not only the Jewish state, but also the students for whom Israel was an integral part of their identities and fed into a larger campaign, um, sorry, fed into a mar much larger campaign. In his mind, Tomer inspired others to follow his lead, and students who had never considered speaking at student government did. The student government firmly entrenched in its anti-Israel um, conclusions were not swayed to change their statement. 
However, other students at this meeting were and were exposed to information about Israel that is not part of the prevailing narrative. Moreover, he encouraged others to step up and speak out then and in the future. It is for that type of leadership that we honor Tomer tonight. Israel was always and has always been a very, very important part of my life. I was born in Israel and I grew up in Ramat HaSharon before I moved when I was six years old to Grand Rapids, Michigan. My grandfather was killed in 1975 and whenever I think about why my connection to Israel is so strong, that's where it starts for me. He dedicated his life and his career to being a member of the IDF. There has been a base in Israel to this day named after him. His name is Shimshon Anjeko. My first few weeks after arriving on campus, I find out about an anti-Israel event happening in the Dayag, which is the main area where students walk by here at the University of Michigan. And it's one of those apartheid walls, stuff sprayed on it, like to exist is to resist, and all the things about delegitimizing Israel, all the common talking points that we've seen over the years the first time I really seen it on full display here on this campus. It, it really bothered me, like I, I didn't talk to the people. I, I was not confident at the time in my ability to, to hold that conversation. I knew always about Stand With Us because I had friends from other states who were high school interns with Stand With Us. So I signed up for the international conference in LA that year. And that's when I found out about Emerson Fellows and what the Emerson Fellowship can bring to a campus and how I could do the stuff to uh, strengthen the um, Israel community here. I used my connections through Wolverine for Israel and the Hillel that I'm a part of and here with the Chabad to try to bring in different speakers through Stand With Us. We brought in Charlotte Korchak from Stand With Us who's one of the most exciting, smart Israel educators that I've seen. The central student government put out a statement condemning Israel for things that didn't happen, making anti-Semitic claims about apartheid state and all the common talking points that we're all way too used to hearing. I signed up for a slot to voice my opinion on their ridiculous statement during that uh, community concerns time. And endorsing that statement to me means that you're against me, against the Jewish people, against Israel. The work that we do together definitely combats that hate. My experience and my time with Stand With Us has given me the tools to be confident in my ability to speak out that I do know the facts and I am educated enough to use that to help others. Israel and Judaism have always been at the core of my family and my community. My great grandfather was expelled from Russia for being a socialist Zionist and he immigrated to Israel. He was the first engineer of the city of Bat Yam. And like all my other great grandparents, he was a pioneer of the state of Israel. My mom and her parents immigrated when she was very young, but the rest of our family still remains in Israel. So by the time I was a bat mitzvah, I had already been to Israel eight times. It was only after my bat mitzvah that I realized and started to understand the complexities surrounding Israel. And I suddenly understood that some basic assumptions that I had had were not shared among everyone. The first being that anti-Semitism was a thing of the past, and the second being that Israel had a right to exist and to self-determination. My goal this year was to help students wake up and care enough to take action. As a high school intern, I reassessed the traditional methods of Israel programming. What I did was integrate Israel content into other clubs so that I was already talking about issues people cared about and using that as a foundation for Israel programming. For instance, I brought programs to my Hebrew class where I discussed Golda Meir and had an activity on coalition building. This is really important because Israeli elections are complicated. Most Israelis don't even understand how Israeli elections work. Now my peers are among the few people in the United States that actually understand how Israeli elections work, all thanks to Stand With Us and the resources that they offered me. I ran programming through the Feminism Club, in which we discussed the unique treatment of women in Israel and women who were enacting change within Israel. In fact, the program was actually used as well at Niles North High School by a fellow intern of mine. I also ran a program 
within the Human Rights Club at school where we discussed the work that Israeli NGOs are doing to support refugees as well as Israeli refugee policy. Because I brought topics that people actually cared about, I was able to reach a majority of the student body. Stand With Us played an integral role in helping me run Israel programming. It was really great to have the cohort aspect of the program. I felt really connected to these people, knowing that we were all having these shared experiences. My journey in combating anti-Semitism and anti-Zionism is only beginning. Next, I'm going to tackle those issues on the college campuses. Because of this internship, I now have the skills to do so. I know how to mobilize people and to effectively implement these programs. And through Stand With Us, I'll always know where to start with the resources and how to begin addressing these issues. Please help me welcome to the stage Tomer and Jekko and Avital Strauss. Jew and a Zionist. This has been this has been a tough few months. It's been a tough few months for all of us. We've all seen the rise in anti-Semitism, the rise in anti-Zionism, and we all know what this can actually do to the world. So I just wanted to reiterate how important it is for all of us. And I feel like I'm not talking to you because I know you're here, so you are activists. But I'm sure you have friends and family that are afraid to speak up just afraid to speak up. And throughout history, Jews have done this. We've done this a bunch of times throughout history when we kind of thought to ourselves, if we just keep quiet, if we just let everything pass, just don't ruffle any feathers, don't rock the boat, everything is gonna go away. It's never worked for us before. And it's not gonna work for us again. I believe, as I'm sure you guys are, because you're in this room, okay, that this is the time to strengthening and deepen our roots in our history, in our shared humanity, in the story of our people, and in the history and facts about Israel, because it never worked for us to be quiet. It just never has. So one of the most important things that I think um, we all need to uh, put emphasis on is education. So educating the young generation onto the story and the history of Israel, educating the young people about anti-Semitism, talking about the hard and difficult issues. This is something that I don't think we should shy away from. I think we should hit it head, head on. And knowing our facts, our history, is what's going to keep us strong. It's going to keep us strong for the next generations to come. There is no question that the state of Israel is not just important for the Jewish people or for Israelis. The State of Israel is a stabilizing force within the Middle East. And what we are seeing is a war that is waged against the legitimacy of the single consistent democracy and the only Jewish state in the world. It's not time to keep quiet. I am thrilled that you're all here. Thank you so much for your activism, for your work, for your partnership, for your support with Stand With Us. And thank you, Stand With Us, for everything that you do. I love you guys, and obviously, hi. Our next speaker went from being an Egyptian would-be jihadist to a political prisoner, to a political dissident, to a prominent Stand With Us educator, and for all to meet him in person for the first time this afternoon because we've been social media friends for a long time. Please join me in welcoming the incredible Hussein Abu Bakr. Thank 
you. Thank you very much, um, everybody. شرف كبير إن أنا أكون معاكم هنا النهاردة. تانو جدول لدبرت خام. هايرف. It's a real pleasure. Thank you. It's a real pleasure to be able to speak to all of you. As you heard, my name is Hussein Abu Bakr Mansour. I'm a proud Stand With Us educator, and I'm a proud Zionist. Thank you. I'm originally from Cairo, Egypt, where I grew up in a typical conservative Muslim family, in a society obsessed with Jew hatred. From an early age, I learned to hate Jews and Israel. Don't be alarmed. I obviously don't hate Jews anymore. Otherwise, this would be very awkward for all of us. <laughs> I grew up very religiously devout, fascinated by anti-Semitic conspiracy theories about how Jews control the world and scheme to destroy everything that is good and holy. My favorite childhood books were about Muslim superheroes foiling Jewish conspiracies all over the globe. The images of suicide bombings in Israel on Egyptian TV on Al Jazeera made me want to become a jihadist to fight those demonic Zionists. By now, you're probably wondering and asking yourself, how did he come to be speaking up in support of Israel at a Stand With Us event? The road to this gala was complicated, uncertain, painful, and dangerous, and it's called education. My anti-Jewish and anti-Zionist obsession led me to try to understand those subhuman demons that I hated so much, the Jews. I started on the internet trying to teach myself the language of sorcery and evil, Hebrew. Unbeknownst to me, my pursuit unintentionally took me through the marvelous edifice of Jewish culture and history, learning not just the Hebrew language, but the stories of Achad Ha'am, Gershom Sholom, Bialik, and Agnon. My search for the Jewish villainy took me through millennia of Middle Eastern and world history. It allowed me for the first time to see one of the most important stories of humanity, the story of the Jewish people. This story traverses centuries and civilizations, as well as the most crucial questions of human existence and our most profound disagreements about man and his place in the cosmos, about faith, law, meaning, hope, and justice. Before I knew it, the journey that I started in blind hatred transformed me beyond imagination. I looked around me in Egypt and I was horrified with the ignorance that causes so much needless suffering. I was young and naive and I didn't understand the difficulty of the task ahead. I took to the, the then starting social media to educate about the darkness of anti-Semitism in which so many Arab societies linger. I tried to warn about the poisonous intellectuals, the predatory politicians, and the toxic propagandists. Suddenly, I found myself disowned by my family and persecuted by my government. In 2010, I was arrested, interrogated, and tortured because I was suspected to be a Mossad agent, a Zionist spy, and a Jewish convert, just because I was a little smart. In 2011, following the Arab Spring and after the initial wave of hope, the Islamist Muslim Brotherhood came to power. I was arrested again, and it was obvious that I had to leave the country. And in 2012, I escaped Egypt, and I received political asylum in the United States. It was extremely difficult to leave everything I knew and come to start my life alone in a new country. Ironically, my story was becoming somewhat Jewish itself. But that also means that it can't only be a story of exile. It also has to be a story of hope. Shortly after I arrived in the US and through mysterious inter interventions of fate, I met Raz Rostein. Raz introduced me to what became my Stand With Us family, a family of passionate and dedicated people who seek to educate, enlighten, and advocate for the truth, and who, like me, believe in education. Stand With Us helped me reach audiences, young and old, students, educators, to share my story and help them combat the rising tides of anti-Semitism and ignorance worldwide. 
Living in the United States, I learned that ignorance is not a disease that plagues only Egypt, and that toxic intellectuals and professors are not an Egyptian monopoly. The realization helped me moderate my own feelings towards my home country and made me understand how crucial the work that Stand With Us does. At Stand With Us, we work around the clock to counter campaigns of misinformation against Israel and the Jewish people, which are carried by lofty ideas and abstractions of delusional academics or tweets of populists and popular culture figures. We help Jewish students on campuses to have a voice and fight for the rights we provide them with the education they need to defend themselves. The, Jew the Jewish people in Israel, on social media, we run platforms in Arabic, English, and Hebrew with millions of followers. In a world filled with propaganda, hatred, and well-funded adversaries, our work is crucial, but not easy, and not cheap. Tonight, I ask you to help us realize our belief in the power of education. Tonight, you have an opportunity to help others make the journey away from blinding hatred and misinformation, not only in the Arab world, but on campuses here in the US, high schools, and media across all of North America and the world. Your support tonight can help bring more voices like mine to this stage and the world stage tomorrow. Please remove your name tags. You'll find a donation card Take a moment to fill it generously. As an Arab Muslim who has tra traveled the challenging road to becoming a Stand With Us educator, I ask you to help us educate and empower your children, your grandchildren, your communities to take a stand against anti-Semitism and to speak proudly for Israel and for the Jewish people. Thank you very much. Todaraba. Shokran. Shokran. Thank you. And now, please join me in welcoming Stand With Us Midwest Board Vice Chair, John Barker. Thank you so much to all of you for your generous support. Together, we will empower our students and communities to inspire the indifferent and educate the misinformed. This is a time when we so desperately need more people to hear and know the truth and more people to take a stand against hate. Thank you for standing with us. Now it's my honor to invite our keynote speaker for the evening on stage to join me. Mati Friedman is a journalist and a prize-winning author. Mati's work as a reporter has taken him from Israel to Lebanon, Morocco, Moscow, the Caucasus, and Washington, D.C. Two essays he wrote about media coverage of Israel after the 2014 Gaza War triggered such an intense discussion that they have been shared on Facebook by over 130,000 times. Please join me in welcoming Mati Friedman, interviewed by Olga Mishwe Washington. Hello. How are uh, you? How How's Illinois treating you? Much warmer than expected. Much warmer than expected. That's good. So, Marty, you were a reporter as well as an editor in the Jerusalem Bureau of the Associated Press. So you've had a front row to how the press covers Israel. How the public feels about Israel, for the most part, is informed by what they know of Israel, which for many people is informed by what they see, what they read, what they understand from what the press gives them. You wrote, the world is not responding to events in this country, but rather to the, the description of these events by news organizations. You've also described the coverage of Israel as the most important story on earth. What is your experience with the press's seemingly obsession with Israel and why do you think that they report so disproportionately to the country's size? This answer will only take two or three days, so I hope that none of you have any plans. There's not much going on here in the Midwest, I know, so I'm just gonna take my time and explain. Uh, first of all, thank you so much for having me. It's wonderful to be here with this great organization. Thanks to Roz and Asaf, and thanks to Olga. The, um, the answer, I'll give a three-part answer, but it, there'll be three very short parts. One part of it, I think, is that when we're asking why Israel gets such disproportionate press coverage, one part of it is that Israel is the Holy Land. 
And Israel looms very large in the Western imagination, much more so than a country like Serbia or a country like Burundi, which is the same size as Israel in terms of population, or even a country like Turkey. When people think about Israel, they're thinking about the Bible. They're thinking about Western civilization, Nazareth, Bethlehem, Jerusalem. These aren't regular places for people in the West. Uh, they're interested in them, and they see Israel as a place where very important events take place, cosmic events, mythic events, and that is, is quite unique in terms of countries on planet Earth, and that's, I think, one part of the, of the reason, if we're being honest. Part two is that it's a really easy place to report on. So if you want to report a conflict, but you want to be in a place that's really fun and safe, uh, Israel's a pretty good option. If you've actually seen a real conflict, it can be very unpleasant and dangerous, but in Israel you can uh, have a, you know, a, a TV a stand-up stand on the Gaza border and you can have a very picturesque plume of smoke in the background and wear a sexy flak jacket and within an hour you're back in the best bar you've ever been in, in Tel Aviv, um, in, a, you know, in a place that's much safer than uh, many cities in the United States, <laughs> which I won't get into which ones. Um, um, and I think, that's quite, I think that's quite seductive for people. There are very few places in the Middle East where you can, be, where you can safely be uh, a, a Christian, or gay, or a woman, or Jewish. And Israel is all of those things, and that makes it a very attractive place to operate. You can say anything you want about the Israeli government and nothing will happen to you. That's quite unique, of course, not just in the Middle East, but in, mo in much of the world. And that makes it a very um, attractive story for many journalists. The third part is the, more, is the most complex part, uh, and I think it's one that people in this room instinctively get, which is that, uh, and this is not really, this takes us out of the realm of journalism and into the realm of history and philosophy. The story about Israel is a story about Jews. And Jews s serve a purpose in Western societies and have for many centuries. What is that purpose? It's to serve as the blank screen onto which negative characteristics are projected. And the nature of the characteristics uh, the nature changes as uh, periods change and as preoccupations change. So for example, if we're looking at the 1800s, people become concerned with capitalism uh, and they decide that capitalism is represented by Jews. The bankers are Jews. And if you read Karl Marx and if you read the thinking of the early communists, that's one of the, uh, one of the important ways they thought about capitalism as being represented by families like the Rothschilds and other Jewish banking families. At the same time, people who were concerned with communism, who feared and hated communism, thought the communists were Jews. So the Bolsheviks were Jews. It's whatever you don't like <laughs> at a given time. And there are many other examples, right? If you're a German in the 20s thinking about racial purity, the symbol of racial, impur racial impurity is Jews. And if you're a French nationalist in the 1800s, then the symbol of cosmopolitanism, people who move around, the symbol of that is Jews. At the same time, if you're a universalist, Jews are tribal. They're clannish. So the Jews are a way of putting a face on whatever you don't like. The Israel story is that kind of story, in my opinion. It's a story about the characteristics that liberal people in the West, and I would certainly uh, identify myself in that group. Uh, Israel, is, uh, Israel features in, in the context of characteristics that liberal people in the West are taught to hate. Colonialism, militarism, racism, nationalism. It's a story that allows people to project characteristics that they consider to be negative onto other people and condemn them. And that makes it such an effective story. That's why it, it arouses such a unique emotion in the West. Right? R Russia can invade Ukraine. The Turks can go at it with the Kurds. Nothing happens in the West. There's no boycott of um, Russian products or Turkish professors. Um, uh, Russian Orthodox churches in Paris do not need to be secured when Russia and Ukraine are having a war. But when Israel acts in Gaza, synagogues in Paris and London and increasingly here need to be protected. It's a completely unique response to a foreign news story. And the secret is, in my opinion, that it's not a foreign news story. It's a morality story. The Israel story is a morality story being told by the West about the West. And that makes it unique, and I think that's a big part of the draw. Sure. <laughs> that was a lot, but, and stuff that I'd never heard of before. Thank you for it. Your second and third point that you mentioned, you spoke of the ease of reporting. Um, the way that I was also hearing that it was quite lazy reporting, if I would be uh, correct in understanding. Would you agree with that? I would not argue. Okay. Um, so would, could I then say that the quantity of the reporting doesn't always have a correlation to the quality of for reporting or even the accuracy in relation to this reporting? Um, in your experience, Marty, is there an impact with regards to a lack of knowledge 
in this later reporting as to the either historical context of Israel or the Jewish people, or even the regional context. What is the impact of that ignorance? I think that, it's, it's a great question, I think that one of the main ways that the story is fictionalized is by eliminating context. Mm. Uh, often reporters are accused of lying, including by high-ranking members of the American <laughs> government until recently. Uh, um, in my experience, and these are my colleagues and in many cases my friends, reporters don't lie outright. What they'll do is they'll flip a story by framing it in such a way that it elicits the political response that they desire. And that usually involves leaving out context. I'll give you an example. Have you ever heard of the America-Italy War of 1944? American soldiers were dying in Italy in 1944. Right? But you've never heard of the America-Italy War because it's called World War II, right? And if you don't understand that it's World War II, it makes no sense that America's in Italy. You have to understand Japan uh, and Germany and Russia and Britain and many other actors, and then you can understand why the Americans are in Italy. The same kind of trick has been played in Israel's case. The story that people know is a story of an Israeli-Palestinian conflict. That's how, and it's been framed in such an effective way that even Israel's supporters think about the story in those terms. That sets up a conflict that's going on on a tiny piece of land that is about 0.2% um, of the landmass of the Arab world. So one fifth of 1% of the landmass of the Arab world, and it involves two actors, Israelis and Palestinians, right? That's the news story. In that framing of the story, one side is much stronger mm -hmm. than the other, and that's true, by the way, that's not a lie and one side is much more prosperous and more Western and more militarized, and, and one side is much weaker, and that makes it a very satisfying story. But it's, it's, in my opinion, essentially a fictional story because most of Israel's wars have not, in fact, been against Palestinians. Right? Israel fights wars against, um, starting from 48, we're talking about Egyptians and Jordanians and Iraqis and Lebanese, and Israel's most potent enemy at the moment is Iran, right? The Iranians are not Palestinians. In fact, the Iranians are not Arabs. They're Muslim, but they're not Arabs. So clearly we're talking about a much broader conflict than an Israeli-Palestinian conflict. And I think Israelis get that instinctively and assume that everyone else knows it, but that's not true. People in the West are getting a highly, um, um, uh, a tightly framed news story about Israelis and Palestinians, which is like talking about an America-Italy war in 1944. You can't make any sense of the story if you frame it in that way, but what it does end up doing is it elicits sympathy for one side and, um, and antagonism to the other side. That's the true purpose of the Israel story for most or many um, journalists, unfortunately, today working in the media. It's not about uh, accurately conveying the complexities of a very complicated little place in a very complicated part of the world, a place, by the way, that's deeply flawed like every other place on earth. It's not about explaining that. It's about, a it's about creating a story about good and evil, something that people in the West can identify with and feel uh, emotional about, unlike almost any other news story in, in the world. If I could tag on to what you speak on leaving out context, so the sin of omission in reporting. Uh, we also see the omission with regards to the challenges that the Israelis and the Jewish people feel. So. Um, you'll see that there are reports, or at least a lack of reports, on the calls to death to the Israelis and, and death to Jews, or even if there is reporting on that, it's like, nah, it's, just, it's mere rhetoric. Uh, is there a sense of anti-Semitism amongst the people that tell these stories that creates this dominant narrative um, where they deliberately choose to either leave the stories out or report them in a way that's inaccurate? I, I don't like the word anti-Semitism, and I don't like it because it's a word invented by someone who didn't like Jews in order to make that hatred seem scientific. And I think it obscures a lot of the complexity of, uh, of what that deep mental virus is. And it kind of gets us out of the, uh, the task of explaining what it is. What is it? It's when you use Jews to illustrate the problems you see in the world. And that doesn't necessarily mean burning crosses on anyone's lawn or sending anyone to a gas chamber. It's much more um, common than that. I think it's quite a common instinct in, in, the, in the West. And we have many, many examples over many, many centuries uh, in completely different political contexts. It's a very useful way to explain things, right? It's basically, it's a way of understanding the world for stupid people. That, that, that's what it is. It's very hard to understand the complexities of planet Earth. This is a really com complicated planet, and everyone's society is very, very complicated, and you really can't handle it. So a way to explain it is to say, um, the Jews did it, right? So if, if you know, the economy is messed up, the Jews are manipulating the currency, if you're worried about communist infiltration, those people are Jews, um, you know, it's whatever, whatever's going, if you don't like greed, then the Jews are greedy, and if you don't, you know, it, it, it's endlessly useful. So I try not to use the word anti-Semitism, I try to 
explain what the, char what, what the characteristic is. What word is. do you use instead, if I may interject? I, I do that whole long explanation, which no one has the time for. <laughs> <laughs> Except you've, you sat so politely and listened to it. Um, I, I, I don't think the people, at least the people who I work with, they don't, they, they don't hate Jews, right? So if you're looking for people with white hoods and swastikas, and it, you're not gonna find it. What, what they're doing is constructing an ideological fantasy that serves to mobilize in their own societies. So you know, when, we're, when we're thinking about, let's talk about Britain, right? What's the skeleton in Britain's closet? Colonialism. So in the British press, it's common to see Israel portrayed in colonialist terms. Uh, in the United States, of course, the demon that stalks this society is race. Uh, and, and I understand why that is the case. And the Israel story for Americans has been framed as a story about race. Basically, the Jews in Israel um, who are, you know, um, you know, Eastern European Jews who are driven out of, of Europe, those who survive, and Jews from uh, the Islamic world who are driven out, th those Jews somehow become stand-ins for white Americans, and the Palestinians have become stand-ins for black Americans, and the whole story has been kind of bastardized to serve as a parable about race in America. Now, I understand that America has to deal with its racial problems, uh, and, I, and I understand why that's such a burning problem at the heart of this country. Israel has nothing to do with that. We have our own demons, which I'm not necessarily saying are, are better, but they have nothing to do with slavery and segregation and, and the, the demons that haunt this country. Israel has to be stood, understood in its own context and on its own terms, and those terms are primarily Middle Eastern. And I think that makes it difficult, not just for, I think that, that, that needs to be understood not just by people who are antagonistic toward Israel, but also by Israel's supporters who exist in an American context and who need to make a leap to the Middle East and understand the context in which we operate, which no longer has very much to do with Warsaw and you know, the great Jewish story of Europe. It has a lot more to do with Aleppo and Kurdistan and Egypt and, and Iraq. Half of the Jewish population in Israel comes from the Islamic world, right? At least half of the Jews in Israel have nothing to do with Europe. And that involves a leap in understanding that is difficult for people growing up in the West, of course, as I did, but it's, it's worth the effort. You recently wrote, you're all Israel now. And so it seems that the press's ideological activism in reporting on Israel has set a precedent for a broader problem. And you kind of alluded to it in your previous statement. In fact, many people actually see Israel as possibly having been the canary for the new cancel culture religion. In your opinion, Marty, has journalism swept or been swept rather into this new religion where um, objective reporting is now suburbent to this new ideology? And if so, how in your experience has a pattern of journalism in Israel or rather regarding Israel been replicated in relation to other items, other people as the target? When I started to think about these issues, I was a reporter for the AP in the Jerusalem Bureau, the AP, of course, the Associated Press, the big US news agency, the world's biggest news organization, according to the AP. Um, <laughs> according to Reuters, Reuters is the world's biggest news organization. So I was a reporter in the AP Bureau, and I, you know, I came at this from the Israeli left. I've always been center left in Israeli politics, and I didn't expect to have any problems in a big American news organization. And I initially thought that the problem was just in our bureau. You know, I think this was 2007, 8, 9, 10, and I thought, you know, something's wrong with the way we are in the Bureau are doing things. And then I realized, actually, this is a problem with the entire foreign press system in Israel. The story had changed from an attempt to accurately portray a complicated place into a kind of activism. It's not that all the reporters had become activists, but the key people in the system had goals that were political and not journalistic. The, the decisions in the bureau were being made for political reasons. Will this story elicit the correct political response from the reader, which involved leaving a lot out and inflating certain things and you know ignoring, and ignoring other things? So I started out with a critique of my bureau, expanded it to a critique of the foreign press in Israel, and when I wrote those essays in 2014 that I think many of you have read, that's what I thought. I thought there was an Israel problem in the press. And if you read those essays, that's what you'll see. And now it's clear from 2021 that the Israel problem was a symptom of something much bigger that was going wrong. Not just in the press, but in many liberal Western institutions that have been kind of hollowed out from the inside and repurposed by very extreme people to serve a completely different purpose. So it's kind of like Night of the Living Dead. You know, you have these organizations that are walking around with the same name, right? Um, Princeton. 
uh, the AP, the, you know, uh, the ACLU, organizations like that, which we identify as the pillars of liberal America, and, and they're up to something else, and that something is, you, you use the word in, words a new religion, and I think that in many ways that's true. I think we've seen, for many people, the collapse of traditional religion, which leaves a vacuum that has to be filled by something, and this is a kind of ersatz religion that provides a sense of good and evil, and a sense of belonging, and we don't know what to call it. Some people call it woke, culture, I don't really have a good, a good name for it, but it's clearly an, an ideology that has arisen in the West to fill the hole that was left by, by religion. And one of the most powerful stories in that world is a story about evil Jews, which is how you know it's a Western religion. <laughs> because Western ideologies usually have some version of that story, whether they call themselves you know, communism or call themselves um, some, you know, any, anything else. So I think that that is the broader context for what I saw, which I did not understand myself at the time, and it's something that I think is affecting many people who you know, couldn't care less about Israel. Um, you know, the, the coverage both on the left and the right has become a kind of demonology. The, the demon changes depending on which side you're on. So you can read a story about demonic republic, or you can read a story about malevolent Democrats, but that gray zone in the middle where we used to operate, where the Jewish community used to operate, that gray zone where things are complicated and people are you know, basically out to do good and sometimes getting it wrong, that center has been eroded in favor of a very binary kind of politics that has kind of swept up many institutions, including the press. Thank you for that. Um, would I be correct in saying or in articulating that in this new religion, um, as it pertains to Israel, there is a predetermined narrative that the world that people are expecting to hear as it pertains to Israel, and facts or information that align with that narrative will make the press, and, and facts and information that does not align with that particular narrative um, won't make the news. What are some misconceptions about Israel and the conflict with the Palestinian people? as well as the region, potentially, that have been repeated so often that they're now just like, oh, it's common knowledge, we don't need to talk about it. Who cares about this piece of information? Um, well, I'll say two things. There, there are certain, um, in, in news we use the term boilerplate. What's boilerplate? It's just kind of the filler that you write in an article. You don't have to attribute it to anyone. You don't have to quote anyone. It's just, that's where you really see what the reporters think. So the boilerplate that I wrote myself hundreds of times at the AP says something like this, and the Palestinians um, would want to set up an independent state in the West Bank and Gaza with its capital in East Jerusalem. Now, anyone who spends enough time really reporting the story understands that the Palestinian cause is the replacement of Israel with an Arab state. It's not the, the creation of a state alongside Israel. And by the way, I don't necessarily see that as illegitimate. I see it as something I can't possibly live with or can't be expected to, you know, to, uh, you know, to, to accept. But okay, you know, people have different uh, desires. Uh, I just think that the role of the press is to accurately describe those desires. So if you're you know, presenting the Palestinian cause as something that Israel could potentially live with, then you can blame the Israelis for not living with it. And that's an example of kind of something that's so accepted by so many people that read the press that um, I, I don't think anyone even questions it anymore. And it's kind of just, it's just boilerplate. So that's a, an example of you know, one piece of information that has been completely fictionalized. In, in press coverage. The, the bigger problem, I think, is related to what we said before, which is the Middle Eastern context in which all of this is happening. So I think people, including Jewish people in America, we grew up with a very European story about Israel. And the story is Theodor Herzl in Vienna and pogroms in Eastern Europe and uh, socialism, the kibbutz idea, the Holocaust, of course, looms very large. And then characters like Golda Meir and Moshe Dayan. And that's a story that, that we know and that animates a lot of support for Israel and animates a lot of the antagonism, increasingly, toward Israel by portraying it as a European colonialist enterprise you know, imposed on the Islamic world. What all that misses is the Middle Eastern nature of everything that's, that's going on. And I think the key to understanding it is accessing Israel through the Middle Eastern side of the Jewish population of Israel. If you really understand that half of the Jews in Israel don't come from Europe, they come from places like Morocco, Tunisia, Yemen, Egypt, uh, Tehran, Isfahan, Aleppo. And if you see the world and if you see Jewish history through that lens, things make a lot more sense and it undermines the attempt to portray Israel as a white colonialist enterprise. Not that that's true of the Jews of European descent, by the way, by portraying Ashkenazim as kind of plantation owners from the south is you know, an, 
is, is ludicrous. Um, but it's certainly not true of Jews who have no um, history in Europe at all and who were expelled from their ancient homes in the Islamic world by their Muslim neighborhoods and neighbors and who see their story as a story about the Middle East. So if you meet an average Israeli and you say, you know, what's your story? They'll say something like, my father fought against the Syrians in 1973, my grandfather fought against the Jordanians in 1948, my grandmother is a Jew from Baghdad who got run out of Baghdad when the Jews were, you know, run out of Iraq in the early 50s. That's a Middle Eastern story, right? It has nothing to do with Palestinians. It's a story about Jews in the Islamic world. Israel's story is a story about Jews in the Islamic world, and that's how it needs to be understood. We're part of a conflict in the Islamic world that involves dozens of actors. Israel is only one minor actor in the conflict. There is no Israeli-Palestinian conflict, conflict in a vacuum. It's part of something much bigger and much more complicated, and that, I think, makes it much less satisfying for people who are looking for an easy ideological kick but it will actually help people make sense of things. I can sit with you all evening, but I've got one more question before I let you go. Uh, you I'm not going anywhere, by the <laughs> way. I just I feel bad for all these nice people sitting there. <laughs> so I could talk all night. You've previously written about the changing role of the press. So the press has gone from not just reporting on events, but actually being activists that are shaping the events. In your experience, how have reporters who report on what's going on in the Middle East, how have they and how do they see their role? I think the role is increasingly seen as activism. And not just in Middle East reporting, by the way. I think reporters are increasingly expected to adopt an ideological position and then use the press as a weapon in whatever ideological battle is being fought. And that's happening on the right, and it's happening on the left. And it's destroyed much of what journalism used to be. And it's also a weapon of diminishing returns, right? So if you use, you know, an organization like the AP as a political weapon, thinking that if you can only tell a certain story, people will believe you. I don't think people are actually that stupid. So I think what happens is that people just stop believing what, what they read. And what you have is people reading, you know, uh, if you're a left-leaning person, then you'll read the New York Times for ideological reinforcement. And if you're a right-leaning person, you'll watch Fox, Fox News for ideological reinforcement. And no one will necessarily believe it, but they're just getting the, you know, they're getting the ideological reinforcement to the vein. And those of us who would like to know what's going on in the world um, will be homeless. You know, and, and many of us are. What are we supposed to? What am I supposed to read? What am I supposed to believe? And we're all living in a kind of blizzard of disinformation, and I don't really have an easy uh, fix for it, except extreme caution when consuming any kind of information. Matthew, thank you so much for this insightful conversation. Thank I'm sure you I'm not so the only one that thoroughly enjoyed it. Thank you. And now welcome, stand with us, Managing Director of Campus Affairs, Leora Bachrach. Hello, I'm Leora Bachrach, and I'm proud to be the National Managing Director of Campus Affairs. I'm standing between you and dessert, so I will be brief. Thank you for attending tonight's beautiful event. Each and every one of you here tonight is an integral part of our mission, and we could not succeed without you. Tonight, you had a glimpse into how Stand With Us supports students from middle school through college and beyond, and you understand how important your support is. Thank you again. Now, please join me in the back of the room for desserts.